Warm welcome to the alumni who are joining us for this webinar today entitled The Role of the Security Sector in Advancing Better Integrated Border Governance in Africa. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I am the Associate Dean and Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I'm pleased to be opening this webinar. This is the sixth webinar of six in our uh, quarterly series that we've been running since 2022 on border, border governance and border security approaches to countering different forms of transnational organized crime across the African continent. Um, just a little bit of background on what the webinar series has been about up until now, our closing webinar. Um, established in 2020, the African Union Border Governance Strategy was designed uh, to improve neighboring states' capacity to work together to improve security, to promote integration, and to facilitate the legal movement of people and of goods across borders. Um, yet, um, questions remain that we're trying to tackle in this webinar about the particular roles that security sector leaders can play in advancing the border governance strategy. So how can security forces consult with border communities to achieve sustainable security uh, through this strategy and beyond? How can militaries and police work across borders to confront some of the um, threats that arise from transnational organized crime that can cross borders? How can governments develop enduring regional reforms, uh, et cetera? And the webinars in the series have sought to address these questions by looking at different kinds of criminal markets involved in transnational organized crime and looking security trend by security trend. So we've looked at natural resource crimes, cattle rustling, human smuggling and human trafficking dynamics, the drug trafficking markets on the continent that extend out um, or are brought in, in from other parts of the world and arms trafficking dynamics. So we've looked at different types of crime we heard from experts from Botswana, Senegal, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Cameroon, DRC, uh, also the East African Police Chiefs Coordination and Cooperation Organization, EGAD, uh, the Kofi Annan Center, um, Regional Center in Accra, the ENACT Project, a key data source on issues like this. Um, so it's been an eventful series. Um, and our experts have sought to provide some insight into the multi-sectoral responses that security sector leaders have been part of mounting to do things like build community resilience to transnational organized crime and to articulate how the security sector fits into integrated border management approaches that engage border communities and local officials in addressing some of the drivers of organized crime. Uh, more information about this whole series and the Africa Center's work on these and other issues is available under the programs tab on our website, and I believe a link will be provided in the Zoom chat as well. Um, and before we go into uh, more of the material for today and introduce our panelists, I'd like to turn things over to our director, Ms. Amanda Dorn. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, and good day. Bonjour. Bom dia, assalamu alaikum, siku and zuri. It's a pleasure to be able to greet you today from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, DC. My name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the Africa Center's director. And I'm very pleased that we're able to greet so many alumni and colleagues today from all over the African continent and even beyond. Also very pleased to be joined by this excellent panel to discuss border security and border governance today. I think in terms of the series Dr. Kelly described, we are finishing very strong in terms of this final webinar for this series with our panelists today. I think most of you know that the Africa Center has been in existence for 25 years now, uh, chartered by the US Congress, and we conduct academic programs and research related to the broad range of security challenges in Africa. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans that's championed by effective institutions that are responsive to people 
and their citizens. The program today is conducted in support of that vision and uses our methodology of peer learning, dialogue, and looking for ways to catalyze strategic solutions. So before I turn you back over to Dr. Kelly, just a quick mention, she has told you that the website, our Africa Center website is the location for all of the previous webinars in this program. It's also the place where you can find our latest research. It's at www.africacenter.org. And if you're not already receiving our daily media news roundup, you can also sign up on the website uh, for, for that daily product in your mailboxes. So with that, let me turn it back over to Dr. Kelly and thank you again to our panelists for joining us today. Great, thank you, Amanda. So with that, let me turn to our two distinguished panelists today. Uh, we're very glad to have them um, for this uh, chapeau concluding session of the webinar series. They are um, Colonel Retired Abdul Ndiaye. He is the former Director of Information and Relations of the Armies of Senegal. He entered military service in 1986. He has uh, been in a variety of interesting um, positions throughout his career. Um, he has functioned in the general staff as deputy coordination of the defense for general studies to the chief of general staff of the president of the republic. Um, he has been also the permanent secretary of the national commission for border management in Senegal and permanent secretary of the national committee in charge of the management of refugees, returnees, and uh, displaced persons, among other things. He also um, has had functions in service management, head of the media strategy division, among other positions. Colonel Ndiaye is a graduate of several civil and military institutions around the world from Senegal, Mali, Ghana, France, and Italy. So welcome, Colonel Ndiaye. We also have Dr. Wafala Okumu. He is the founding director of the Borders Institute and an honorary fellow at the Center of African Studies at the University of Edinburgh. He has served in various positions in international organizations while also teaching at different universities around the world. His work and publications have been on topics uh, of a wide variety, including borders, border security, in addition to democracy, human rights, international institutions, and humanitarian assistance in Africa. He's the author of a wide variety of academic uh, and policy publications. Um, one of many um, of note is his report on the African Union at 20, African Perspectives on Progress, Challenges and Prospects, uh, co-edited with Andrews Atta Asamoa. He's also written quite a bit on resources and border disputes in East Africa region, amongst other places, and has been a part of um, implementing the African Union border strategy over the years as well. So welcome, Dr. Okumu, as well. Uh, with that, I think we'll jump into the moderated question and answer. And I'd like to start with Dr. Okumu. Could you um, speak to us or remind us of the key components of the 2020 African Union strategy for a better integrated border governance? What are sort of the five pillars of the strategy and why are they relevant for the practitioners who are here thinking about countering transnational organized crime? And I'll ask you to spend maybe about seven minutes on this, um, and, and then we'll move to the next question. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kelly and uh, the African Center for Strategic Studies for organizing this uh, important uh, event uh, on this very important day. And I join the other participants in uh, celebrating Africa Day. And I hope that uh, I'll be meeting you again next uh, month when we celebrate uh, June 20th, the Africa Border Day. Um, the first of all, let me uh, contextualize the question by giving you just a brief uh, overview of uh, the strategy. Initially, it was dubbed the African Secure Strategy for the Enhancement of Border Management in Africa, but changed to African Union Strategy for a Better Integrated Border Governance in 2015. This strategy is a an activation of Article 25 of the AU Convention on Border Cooperation, otherwise also known as the Niamey Convention, that aims to ensure efficient, 
and effective integrated border management. Article 3.4 of that convention also commits African member states to cooperate in security matters, especially combating cross-border crimes, terrorism, piracy, and other forms of crimes. Article 5 of the convention requires AU member states to share information intelligence requested by another state party and to take necessary steps to promote and facilitate information intelligence sharing related to protection and security of border areas. Unfortunately, as of today, only 18 member states have signed the convention and only six have ratified. The ratific the, in order for it to come into force, it requires 15 ratifications. Uh, the strategy um, on fo in focus today is built on understanding that African countries are not effectively governing their borderlands. And this is posing uh, threats to their sovereignties. Uh, the strategy calls for coordinated and cooperative border management between African countries by ensuring that various stakeholders within border spaces interact cooperatively in their management. Uh, it has five uh, pillars. And the original strategy that I mentioned had three pillars of cooperation, coordination, cooperation and coordination, capacity building and, and uh, community involvement. But this one has five. Uh, the first pillar relates to developing state border governance capacities. And this pillar is regarded as a instrument of, for the achievement of other pillars. And this objective is to encourage the emergence of African managers and border practitioners with solid theoretical background on border governance and cross-border cooperation. It recommends, among other things, the development of comprehensive research and training agenda and harmonized regional and continental standards. The second pillar uh, relates to promoting cross-conflict uh, resolution, border security, and transnational threats. It aims at preventing and resolving border conflicts and addressing cross-border threats, crime, and insecurity. In particular, to and of interest to uh, this webinar is Pillar 2B, that directly relates to addressing cross-border threats, crimes, and insecurity due to porosity of borders, lack of state presence, and local communities' involvement in cross-border crimes. Objective 3D of this pillar specifically makes recommendations to improve border management, security of border management, and by doing the following things. One, establishing principles and measures of cooperative border management. Second, giving border management agencies relevant mandates, capacities, and resources. Three, investing in technology for surveillance and border control. Uh, for collecting and processing information and biometric identification of travelers. Uh, five, putting in place anti-corruption and oversight mechanism to ensure border officials are not economically vulnerable to corruption. And then, uh, 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 and then it also establishes inter-ministerial mechanism at national, regional um, levels on cross-border crimes, and finally, uh, it, it calls for adopting legal instruments to allow joint security intervention to fight transnational organized crime, including terrorism, piracy, and other cross-border crimes. The second uh, pillar um, is less to safeguarding legal cross-border um, mobility, migration, and trade. And this pillar aims at turning African borders from barriers into bridges by facilitating legal cross-border mobility, migration, and trade. And the objective is simply to, and the objective of this pillar is to be implemented through facilitation of inter-regional, continental, and international trade, as well as the regularization of in informal, small-scale cross-border trade and establishing safe borders, among other things. The, the, the fourth, um, the fourth, um, the fourth uh, pillar, uh, relates to working towards what we call cooperative border management. And this, uh, it, it, the, the background, this is that the, 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 security, the, the, the strategy notes that 
Border management in Africa lacks coherence, uh, harmonized institutional and legal frameworks and procedures, and it exhibits low levels of accountability and oversight. Then the, pil the, the pillar seeks to balance uh, the easy and legal movement of humans and goods across African borders and prevent the illegal activities and security through effective and efficient joint arrangements. Uh, it points out that the requirements to comply with the multiple controls and comply with the numerous regulations distract, detract border agencies from preventing and, uh, uh, and detecting illegal activities or performing their controls effectively. Uh, it acknowledges that corruption or corrupt practices and compromise integrity at border posts do not only undermine the rule of law and, and national security and sovereignty, but negatively impact policy choices, revenue collection, and economic growth through generation of false statistics. And uh, then it also um, uh, calls for what we call cooperative border uh, border um, uh, border control uh, border cooperation, um, um, which has uh, four levels. Uh, the, the, and then also it points out areas of cooperation and seeks to enhance cooperation at those four levels. Um, and, the, and then the last uh, pillar uh, relates to fostering borderland development and community engagement. And this, the, the pillar point, the, the strategy points out can be achieved by ensuring the participation of communities at the, uh, in the border governance in the following ways. One is by ensuring that there is a full engagement and cooperation of border communities. Second, that uh, uh, the, the border communities are sensitized to ensure that they do not threaten state uh, or, uh, or they engage or to engage in cross-border crimes, and then that they're involved in border, they're involved in, uh, in security schemes such as uh, uh, policing, and then ensuring that they, have, they fully participate in the governance of the, of the border or the borderland. Uh, then lastly, that uh, um, the, the state should also increase its presence in the borderland so that uh, they, they, they don't appear to be a state vacuum, which um, allows uh, criminal syndicates and criminal networks to occupy that vacuum because of lack of, of state presence. So mm -hmm. but, uh, in, in short, those, those are the uh, overview of the, the, the strategy and as well as the, the key pillars. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Okumu, for reviewing us on that. Um, always important to keep the five pillars in mind. Um, we have been trying to do that throughout each of the five webinars focused on different forms of organized crime. Um, yeah, so developing state and border governance capacities, promoting conflict resolution, border security and transnational threats, uh, countering of transnational threats, safeguarding, cross-border mobility, legal migration and legal trade, working towards cooperative border management, the floor, and then fostering borderland development and community engagement is a good way to end um, in terms of reminding us of the pillars because uh, for uh, Colonel Jai, uh, that's sort of part of the, what I wanna focus on in my second question. Alors, mon colonel, uh, c'est uh, votre... uh, Colonel, it's your turn to address these questions. So the question, second question for you has to do with, we've got about seven minutes, if you could cover the following question. How does the African Union strategy for better integrated border governance, how has it been a useful tool in fighting uh, cross-border criminal activity in Senegal. We know that you've done a lot of work to implement certain projects which relate to the various pillars in the strategy. So how does the strategy become a useful tool in Senegal? Thank you for inviting me to this quarterly meeting uh, since the AU creation. Unfortunately, the interpreter is 
not hearing. So integrated cross-border governance and public policy is taking into account security issues, infrastructure, the environment and sustainability. And this is allowing countries to better harmonize their approaches in the design and elaboration of cross-border agreements um, to allow these practices to uh, function more effectively. And this is also a way of allowing cross-border areas to develop and to have better access to development and to prevent illicit activities. As an example, Senegal, Senegal complies with colonial borders uh, such as its border with Gambia. So in the Kurgan area where the Gambian police uh, focus on immigration and there were conflicts, but we were able to demonstrate that a particular village in Gambia was allowing illegal immigration to pass. So Senegal was able to confirm this and begin working on this particular issue. In the Jaha community, we were we were able then we were then able to build the necessary infrastructure and so this particular issue was able to be resolved in 2016 the senegalese head of state was able to was able to create a task force to deal with transporter issues so the issue is eliminating threats of a transporter nature and these measures correspond with the senegalese design and conception of these particular transporter issues senegal is one of the new players to promote cross-border cooperation in terms of security in Africa. And Senegal has a multinational approach and multi-sectorial approach. So uh, to read, to respond to your question, strengthening borders has benefited from this organization and the strengthening of capacities of many actors in this area in order to effectively address cross-border criminal activity. The integrated security measures on a national and international level has been made more effective so that commercial exchange and anti-terrorist activities were able to be more effectively undertaken. In the army, the police, customs, we have international cooperation, and this is bilateral and multilateral in nature. In terms of the armed forces, the idea was to strengthen its control over Senegalese territory, and we have units within the army that are specialized, particularly on the border with Mali and Senegal, to handling these types of issues, especially Garci. Garci is cooperation with the European Union, and we this is a rapid intervention group. All of these units are uh, located at, at the border areas. And with the police, uh, there is there are efforts to combat transporter criminal activities. And so through application of legislation and regulations for entry into Senegalese territory, 
transmission or sharing of information across borders, we've been able to handle various types of, of traffic efforts. In terms of borders, fighting against organized transnational crime involves the transporter police infrastructures. And these efforts are not only at sea, but on land. And we've implemented a fixed provision, which is an advanced border effort. And so at the central level in the interior ministry, we also have a division, which we call the National Division to Combat illegal immigration and fighting against uh, human trafficking and drug trafficking in order to identify infrastructures related to illegal immigration and false documents and those sorts of networks have also been targeted so in this structure we have so we have a plan, a national plan to accomplish this mission. So in terms of the borders, as we spoke of the special commissions in this area, these commissions uh, work within cells to uh, fight against illegal immigration, for example. In terms of uh, in terms of transnational organized crime, we also have systems in place, what we call security posts, and it's a system that we also uh, have worked with Interpol with on the borders, and then the uh, judiciary is implicated as well. We also have a center to, uh, it's a new tool that we have that allows us to analyze, uh, to analyze uh, and research persons of interest, POIs, to be able to uh, profile uh, certain persons who are being, uh, investigated and so we have a system of information gathering uh, intelligence gathering to uh, to find certain persons that we are seeking in terms of the uh, international cooperation with uh, our security forces and police we we integrate all of these services under a particular structure that we have in place, not Niger, Gambie, Ghana. There's a coordination for uh, these countries uh, for the transfer of information and to gather uh, this information to share data on any crimes being committed on the border areas. And so we therefore provide analytical structures to inform all the countries. And we also have a cell that we call CIRT. It is a anti-trafficking harbor uh, organization that is uh, really seeking to work in the airports and the ports in the countries where countries that are countries of transit for different crimes uh, for illicit merchandise and to seize illicit merchandise. We also have in information uh, with the borders and with the 
customs uh, offices with the police and the gendarmerie on the borders to all work together. So this uh, center, it has an is of capital importance and its mission is to put into place the management of security and police efforts. So it is a centralizing um, mechanism for information and to, for sharing of police information at all levels. So there is the national level, there is the regional level, sub-regional of ECOWAS to allow uh, ECOWAS to have information sharing and intelligence sharing. And so in these in this framework the international organizations can reinforce borders protect persons we work with the european union we work with other uh, police organizations uh, the sound has been cut off from the speaker uh, there are Senegal has uh, been a great partner in this effort in uh, to have collaboration between the different countries and sharing of information to determine the crime, transnational border crime. And different countries are working together with us. We had the country level at bilateral levels. Thank you so much. So we've had a very good overview of different parts of the security sector of justice. What are the measures in place? What is the pertinence to put into um, to implement all of these different strategies. Thank you, Colonel, for having described all of this in detail, what you have in place in Senegal. I am going to ask another question of you to continue our exchange. As our the um, Assistant Counselor for the Security in Senegal, you have played an important role in the implementation of the cultural um, importance of good neighbors. These are different groups that were put into place in six communities with different uh, borders with Mauritania, with Gambia to implicate and involve women and young people in the border areas. In my question in six minutes, please, how can this project implicate the security sector and why has this project been important to uh, counter the challenges that are experienced such as with ECOWAS? Yes, so yes, we have this with the border with Mauritania, as you said, Mali, Gambi. Three years ago, the uh, National Commission of Borders um, uh, put this concept in place. So we have, um, we consider these people as socialization experts to involve the community. So it, these, or these were established in border towns. And so, um, in, with a reminder that this was a Senegalese effort, there are some populations on the borders that are part Senegalese, part from Gambia, they're, you know, different provenance. So, the, we did want to clearly affirm the sovereignty of Senegal on Senegalese territory. These uh, groups, uh, CASC, they are called, uh, also provide a, a very important social value in the communities. These are the exchanges. These are uh, 
it was very important to to um, diffuse any conflicts within the community. In the past, not nowadays, these groups that can manage any conflicts locally. And then the third function of these groups, these CAS, is uh, to work in the border areas to to uh, really encourage good neighborliness between the different peoples on the on the two sides of the border and both oftentimes the community is separated in two they are socially and culturally the same but with a border between them so we are seeking also to bring these populations closer together oftentimes uh, you have these areas are areas of conflict like between herdsmen and farmers so we have in place people who are responsible to uh, for the transmission and diffusion of information to diffuse conflicts and can also um, communicate essential information related to security to the National Commission of Border Areas. And also, we also uh, worked with a Japanese cooperation. There were two uh, CAS areas, uh, groups that we created with the border with Mauritania. We organized seminars with 50 young people who are from the commune of Tekan from Mauritania and the commune of Birkama from Senegal. So these young Senegalese and Mauritanians uh, were able to work together. And the objective of this seminar is to get these young men and women to uh, to learn to uh, encourage and manage peace and um, democracy. Within this project, we established new strategies So we also implicated the armed forces to uh, teach uh, leadership um, to these young people. These uh, workshops brought together uh, high levels of persons from the security forces and the armed forces. And to uh, really teach over a three-day workshop how to defuse area conflicts and to find responses that were adapted to the different situations, the different conflicts. During these activities, there was the resolution 1325, uh, women, peace and security, and 2250, youth, peace and security. And this was put in place. These two resolutions were adopted. So, so in we wanted territorial sovereignty and cooperation with Gambia, with Mauritania, and to encourage cooperation amongst everyone, and to improve the um, relationships between the bordering communities. In terms of um the work we did first uh, the work it, it depends on the geographical location first of all we need areas that are on the border of course first off so this uh, follows the vision that was created to um really have the populations involved and Oftentimes, earlier I spoke to you 
of the respect of the principles of the strategies of governance that took place. I spoke earlier of, of one of the first groups that were put into place in these areas in Gambia in a village, the populations of these areas, they uh, could um, they could come and use the electricity to make sure that their phones were always fully charged for information gathering and sharing. So people got together and sang and danced. So in that same area on the border, there was no infrastructure of a medical nature either in the Gambian or Senegalese village. So what we did was to build next to the house a consultation clinic. So in each neighborhood, there was an older lady with certain knowledge. And so these clinics were designed for women. in order to support women who were pregnant. So these women were there to provide consultation services. Uh, and then we also had guides located in these transporter houses. And we also located them at weekly markets. These are very important centers of course, either in the north, in the south, the center in where there's the Gambian border. So we have a large number of people who visit these markets in these locations that are along the borders. So issues could be addressed in uh, the houses that we built related to these influxes of people around the markets. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting example that was applied in several parts of Senegal on several borders with other countries. So it's quite uh, interesting as well to have a little perspective about the role of women, the Bajenago and, and young people, as well as the security sector. So thank you for giving us uh, a bit of a case study about what's happening with the project. Thank you. All right, I am going to return to Dr. Okumu now and ask him um, two more questions. Um, so Dr. Okumu, um, I'd like for you to give us a perspective from outside of Senegal. Um, you do a lot of work in Kenya. You've done a lot of work um, in other regions of Africa. So Dr. Okumu, what have been some of the recent successes and challenges to implementing integrated border governance initiatives to counter crime um, in, in other parts of Africa. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Kelly, and uh, also uh, Colonel Dia for sharing that rich uh, experience. Actually, you have uh, provided a very good foundation for me to share the successes and uh, some of the successes and uh, the challenges. First of all, let me start with the successes. Um, despite the lack of uh, AU leadership and support, uh, some elements of the strategies are being implemented in various uh, uh, ways across the continent. Uh, for instance, uh, integrated border management is being done through development of common border management uh, guidelines and establishment of uh, uh, one-stop border posts in borders such as uh, those between Rwanda and Uganda, Kenya and Uganda, uh, Kenya and Tanzania, Zambia and, Ga Zambia and uh, um, his neighbors, one of his neighbors, I can't remember the exact border, but in Ghana and, and Togo and uh, Nigeria and Benin and a couple of my others. Secondly, another success we can point out is that uh, other aspects of, uh, of this strategy include the formation of uh, border management committees. I think Kanondia was uh, kind of hinting to that, uh, consisting of various uh, working uh, agencies working together at a particular border. Uh, in some instances, local stakeholders such as traders, uh, elders, and others have been included in these committees. And there are also cases where uh, these management committees have they, they, they meet with counterparts on the other side of the border 
uh, and there are several countries that have uh, what you call joint uh, border coordinating committees uh, that include personnel from uh, both sides of the border. And I think Kandundia also hinted to that. Uh, then there are several countries that have formed uh, joint border commissions. Uh, those countries that are forming and maintaining joint border commissions have higher successes in countering uh, transnational organized crimes than those that don't have. Uh, joint border commissions or JBCs are usually organized at several levels. Uh, they are either organized at, at local level, expert, expert level, where you have specialized committees, including uh, those on border security. And then uh, you have at ministerial level, mostly uh, foreign ministers, but also sometimes uh, sect sectoral, uh, such as internal security ministers meeting. And then uh, sometimes it can escalate it up to the head of states uh, or head of government level, where they meet and tackle issues that uh, the lower levels have been unable to, 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 go, to tackle. And then there, there is also increased recognition of the importance of uh, community sensitive border management. And I think uh, from the presentation of uh, Kanondia, we saw that coming across very clearly. And this is actually being reflected in many parts of uh, Africa and many countries are actually uh, uh, seeing sense of uh, take, uh, embracing this approach of community sensitive border management. Uh, this is due to developing mindset uh, from state centric approach that prescribes top down uh, measures to challenge uh, uh, to the challenges facing borderlands. Uh, this approach of top down usually criminalizes borderlands by calling them havens or or criminal groups that cut out activities threatening national and regional security. And uh, it also claims that if left unchecked, uh, cross border movements can contribute to the operations of terrorists and criminal organizations and exacerbate uh, uh, security problems. So it's expected that, um, I mean, there's increasing uh, movement and uh, changing this mindset. And there are a lot of uh, research uh, are taking place. For instance, there is uh, one research that's been carried out by Concordis International and is being supported by uh, cross-border conflict evidence and policy trends, except that's in Central Africa, that's looking at um, how these local arrangements at the borders uh, contribute, are, are, are uh, partnering with governments to uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, governance of, of borderlands. And also another uh, in, uh, success we can uh, note across is the rest to increase training in, in border management uh, uh, personnel in uh, uh, integrated border management. Uh, and among the challenges that uh, I've, we've noted is that uh, there are still uh, competing ideas, uh, interpretations and understanding of the meanings of, of the border in Africa. Uh, and this can lead to challenges because if you have two countries uh, have different understanding or different perspective of what the border functions or functions are or its purpose is, that can lead to challenges, uh, problem, uh, friction in, in, in managing joint, joint management of that border. And then also what we have seen is that uh, the, the strategy, it lacks a coordinated implementation at continental and uh, regional level. Uh, and with, with the liquidation of the African border program, from its structure, uh, the AU seems to be, have generally abandoned border issues. Some of its external partners, however, have stepped in to fill the void. Uh, but then uh, the fear is that they're doing it uh, on their terms and in their interests. Uh, the strategy uh, from, my, from my analysis is not yet an African solution to African uh, problems or border, security, border insecurity problems. Uh, Africans, uh, African borders are still managed from Europe uh, and and, uh, and and American countries, European and American countries, and this co these countries have actually moved their borders to Africa. Uh, what we see is that um, um, it is an irony that while Europe has softened its borders, uh, it has moved them to Africa, that in turn has hardened, or they are, is hardening its borders. So today, it's easier for an African to travel to Europe than to another African countries, despite the adoption of the African passport. Uh, most of the procedures used to control uh, crossing of African borders are in positions from Europe and America. It's not about that only four countries have ratified the protocol on free movement of persons. And that's the AU's protocol on free movement of persons. Also the strategy uh, from my knowledge of it is that uh, 
it's, it's generally a product of a European response to the migration crisis in Europe. Uh, and that contributes to the, the multiple uh, versions that we have had uh, 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 in generating this strategy. Uh, also, what um, we have noted another challenge relates to capacity building uh, that should that doesn't go beyond a training of personnel uh, that to, to enhance the infrastructural capacities, that's say equipment and facilities, mm -hmm. also to include systems and legal frameworks and policies. Mm -hmm. And that that has also not uh, been uh, observed uh, generally across the continent. Uh, Great. Well. Uh that that really takes us into the next question I wanted to ask you sort of your outlining of some of these challenges here at the end um, in spite of also many successes and thank you for the examples from um, other parts of the continent in terms of um, the one-stop border posts the different border commissions and um, you know community sensitive sort of projects that are being developed in terms of um, sort of Pan-African or at least um, cross-border cross, cross border regional sort of initiatives, you spoke a little bit about the increase in training, but also the need to go beyond training um, just of uh, individuals and think more about legal framework systems, um, the broader implications of a good training. I know that you've done trainings on border management and border security issues for a good part of your career. Um, particularly for officers or officials working with EGAD and ECOWAS. So could you spend maybe six or seven minutes talking about what some of the insights of these trainings are? What are some of the key messages um, that go into these trainings um, when they're most successful? Um, particularly um, thinking about insights there might be from what you've observed in the trainings or integrated into the trainings. What are the insights for security sector actors who are hoping to um, you know, take away some lessons for countering organized crime within the integrated border management uh, frame. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kelly, for that nice question. Uh, first of all, uh, let me let you know that um, um, I was instrumental in um, designing the, the, the African Union border strategy. And also alongside that, uh, we were to design uh, a curriculum, uh, which was to undertake uh, to do the training, which uh, uh, on issues uh, reflected in the in the curriculum in the in the, in the strategy, uh, but um, let me start by pointing out that it's important to note that uh, uh, developing uh, state border governance capacity is one of the uh, the, the, the strategy's pillars. And uh, from my experience, I've noted that African border personnel need to change their mindsets, uh, particularly that of criminalizing and securitizing uh, borderlands. Uh, to that, to regard border communities as as stakeholders and partners in in border governance, and again we saw in Cameron Diaz's uh, presentation that came, uh, we can see that change of mindset um, is a, is a, is actually something very important, uh, good to to note. Uh, so we, uh, the, uh, the the managers of African borders uh, must fully embrace integrated border management as the best approach. For governing borderlands, uh, particularly the function of facilitating and, and cross-border activities, because this function should not be uh, to co control. Control is usually about blocking, uh, but facilitating easy movement, uh, not free movement, but easy movement. Uh, that's very critical. Uh, then another another thing I've noted is that it's a win-win situation when all stakeholders are involved in managing borders. And this is something I bring across when we do the training. Uh, locals assist the government to increase revenue collection, uh, which is in turn used to develop the borderlands by providing them with the basic infrastructure such as health, uh, health, health centers and schools. And the government officials on their part efficiently undertake uh, their primary and key functions with cooperation of locals. And when this happens, then uh, the, the work they do is efficiently done and more effectively, uh, the, the, out, the outputs are more effectively uh, uh, attained. Also, um, what I've uh, noted is that no uh, personnel should be deployed to secure, guard, protect, control, or perform any border management function unless uh, they have been comprehensively sensitized in how to relate to and to work with local communities. 
once uh, border management personnel have been transformed, have transformed their mindset on the understanding of the borderlands, they must acquire skills of relating to the inhabitants as well as recognizing, acknowledging, appreciating, and making efforts to work with locals arrangements. And again, Senegal has, pro, uh, has shown that, that that can be done and it's happening. And they must also recognize that local communities are stakeholders and treat them as partners rather than mm -hmm. as enemies. And then also all personnel deployed to borders must undergo basic training. The African Border Program developed a curriculum in 2012 with modules that focused on topics such as uh, trends and concepts in border management, uh, professionalism, ethics and integrity, communication, document analysis, uh, behavioral analysis, integrated border management, sensitization, uh, and a uh, couple more others. Unfortunately, this curriculum was never administered. Uh, but if these courses that uh, I just pointed out had been offered or are being offered, I'm sure African borders will be more efficiently and professionally managed today. And most of the border management courses being offered today, as we talk, are donor-driven uh, with the focus on managing uh, American and European borders in Africa. And uh, lastly, uh, one of the, the best lessons, one of the best sessions, I mean, uh, in the training workshops that I have conducted is one in which the participants exchange experiences and learn lessons from each other. And during uh, this, uh, uh, this session, uh, best practices are on operations, uh, strat strategic issues, knowledge, and skills transfers that cannot be found in a foreign, in a foreign dry, uh, dry, uh, designed uh, curriculum are shared by the participants. For example, in one of the training workshops I was doing in IGAD region, a, a participant shared with others how to detect ingested drugs. And another one was sharing on how to detect a laptop with dangerous material at the, at the border crossing point. Uh, so these are some of the uh, things that have observed and there are a couple more that are cool, but because of time, I, I, I'll reserve for next time or during the question and answer. Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kumu. I was going to say, uh, speaking of question and answer, we're almost there. I have one more question for Colonel Ndiaye. But if people have questions that they want to start putting into the chat, we'll start processing those questions for the Q&A. Um, and yes, Dr. Kumu, maybe you can share some more examples um, of what people have shared uh, different African countries, African officials, uh, specific lessons or practical sort of tips um, that you learned through the EGAD trainings. Maybe you can, maybe there's time to share some of that in the Q&A. For now, let me turn back to Colonel Ndiaye. Oui, mon colonel, une dernière question pour vous. So one last question for you, Colonel, before starting the question and answer section. You already touched upon this theme, but if you have other examples to share, you're welcome to share them with us. Do you have any ideas to share to us in terms of how to efficiently combine military approaches and civilian approaches to assure the security of the border regions in today's security context? Are there lessons learned from, uh, from the mixed technical committees that you have observed or worked on with your colleagues in Benin or Cote d'Ivoire? I know that you're very involved with both military and civilian involvement and how to combine these different um, modalities of expertise in terms of the integrated governance of the borders. So you have five minutes if you would uh, shorten your answer a bit, please, so we can have enough time for the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. We cannot separate uh, in the analysis of conflicts in Africa. You have to think of 
you have to look at the origins of the conflicts and you have to look at the question of exclusion and that's why the project in Senegal um, really uh, focused on inclusivity in all of our programs and we also spoke of national strategies we there to fight transnational organized crime so we are really seeking to develop prosperity because uh, uh, social inclusivity economic inclusivity in terms of the organizational plan the um president established a decentralization one of the objectives was to allow more development and overcome the inequalities of different groups especially on the borders and this was um, established in the uh, territorial acts and this allowed us to re-establish the confidence and trust of the local populations working in very close and tight collaboration with the communities this led to a buy-in a stronger buy-in from the local populations each year we organize we organize a uh, events between uh, Senegal and Mauritania, Senegal and Mali, and where the local populations play a essential, crucial, central role, because it is so important in the fight against international crime to have the local communities involved. In terms of the different mechanisms place, put in place, there is also we've had a good cooperation good technical partners uh, from germany as well who worked with us so we have put into place instruments that we call local groups that take into account that that allow us to consult with the local communities and so then the technical commission can work with the two countries on each side of the border and work on uh, putting into place institutions that that allow a better cooperation, a better democratization of these um, exchanges. And so these governmental border um, organizations and institutions will uh, reinforce mechanisms that were put into place by this um, decree for African borders. So we also put into place methods to manage these border areas. There is a commission that is a national commission and uh, for Senegal and also for Mali. And this is a there's a pilot program put in place that is run by the governments. So the regional committee of Tamakumba and the mixed technical commission for more cooperation is supported uh, by Senegal, Mali, and Mauritania. So border cooperation was started at the local level as well to for the departments of Bacau and Senegal and Kai and Keneba as well that uh, were uh, 
put into place. So this is really to manage together and to uh, the consolidation of peace and the fight against crime in these border areas. In 2015, there was the development of a trans-border program uh, where in these border spaces, different activities took place. The uh, awareness building and raising of the different populations and the implementation of processes that follow the African Union Convention to protect also to manage uh, fishing and hunting rights and different problems that were identified by the Commission to to ensure that uh, the uh, border populations were protected in terms of their needs. So this is the general uh, program of, co of border cooperation that was put into place at the uh, regional, sub-regional level. And this, and so, we already have in place a certain level of cooperation on the border in the border areas that we can build upon. So in terms of the management of these border areas, the Senegal, uh, there's the PBS, the Peace Building for Security. Program, Senegal is Senegal benefits from this program that is in the Gambia. So when there is a threat at the border levels in terms of the PBS, we, there, we are entering an oper the operational phase to support this PBS. And we can therefore assist areas who might need a security post, a security um, uh, reinforcement in certain zones, certain areas. In terms of Senegal, Mali, and Mauritania, we've already designed these strategies with the help of uh, the UN as well. We have created areas where people can establish infrastructures to assist the local populations. Uh, and so this is just very general, but just a few mechanisms that exist in the border areas that are uh, leverages to counter the threats from transnational organized crime. We thank you and we thank Dr. Okumu to have given us a lot of information and examples. The uh, case study in Senegal, very instructive in several areas. And for Dr. Okumu also gave us comparative analysis, regional comparative analysis, as well in terms of the context of the U African Union, where we've been, where we're going in terms of policies, border policies, strategies, and the terms of border management. One question that we've gotten, um, I, I think I'll break into a couple of different parts. Um, so I, I wanted to have uh, both of you talk a little bit more about, in terms of um, promoting secure borders, one point um, that both of you have made in one way or another relates to um, free movement or um, easy movement, as Dr. Okumu said, and the importance of mobility rather than restriction 
in um, you know engaging people who are citizens and border communities in in being um, sort of amplifiers of resilience to organize crime in their communities. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, we've talked about the AU strategy for a better integrated border governance today and the, the previous AU border policy. Could you also talk about how you see something like the African Continental Free Trade Agreement um, and developments related to that over the last year playing into um, how we might do um, better integrated border governance in Africa today? So that's that's one way I think of getting at this more general question we've been asked. Um, I think um, another question that we have in terms of sharing experiences, um, what is in place at the level of ECOWAS and at the level of the Sahel? Um, so there's a question specifically, I think related to Dr. Okumu, maybe what you've shared about EGAD and sort of common training, common sharing of experiences, practices and approaches for engaging with border populations. Um, do you have any um, thoughts on the ECOWAS or Sahel, um, sort of region-wide um, state of affairs? Uh, I see a couple of other questions coming in here. Uh, there's a, a question about gender, um, and I know da Colonel Njai, you mentioned this um, uh, somewhat in some of the, your answers to the earlier questions, but if... Um, both panelists could speak a bit more about um, the, the role that gender plays um, in the creation and the implementation of these different strategies. So how did you integrate your gender analysis into creating um, and implementing some of the different projects that you've talked about that relate to border management? Uh, and so those are three questions. Um, I think it would also be useful, Dr. Okumu, as you suggested, if you wanna share a little bit more about particular skills, particular practices or particular approaches for design or implementation of border management programming from your EGAD training, I think those examples would also be welcome. So let's do a first round with that and see, see where we stand in terms of time afterwards. Um, I'll ask Dr. Okumu to respond first to any or all of those um, questions we have out there. The one on the continental free trade area, EGAD examples, are there any relevant examples of skills, practices, or approaches in terms of ECOWAS or the Sahel as well? Um, and um, uh, uh, the, the role of gender in designing um, or implementing or updating some of these policies. And then we'll go to Dr. Njai. Dr. Okumu, if you could take maybe four minutes or so, I know that's a short amount of time, but um, we'll, we'll try to see what we can do with that. Thanks for those uh, uh, questions. Um... Uh, let me attempt to give the best shot. Uh, st starting with um, uh, the question on free movement, free and easy movement, um, I pointed out in my presentation that um, um, the African the African Union has um, adopted, uh, uh, not adopted, but uh, as a, a protocol on uh, free movement uh, of people and establishment. And that protocol is um, supposed to enhance the uh, the, the African uh, free free uh, free trade area uh, um, arrangement. However, the sad thing is that although the uh, the agreement that uh, relates to the free trade area has been uh, almost uh, signed by and and also ratified by most of the African countries. Actually, it has one of the highest ratification of the AU treaties. Uh, the protocol, unfortunately, um, has not has not been uh, uh, ratified. It has it uh, it has only been ratified by 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 four countries, by, by four countries uh, so far, and um, this means it will require um, at least um, more than um, uh, uh, um, more than almost twenty countries before it can come into force. So what that simply says is that uh, the implementation, the the the, the, the dream of uh, borderless Africa is still a long, a long way to go. And uh, even the, to achieving that, as it's called for in the Agenda 2063, uh, will uh, require a lot of uh, um, action on the part of the AU. Particularly this time, as we talk, the sad thing is that um, in the new structure of the AU, the, the, the border program is not is, it was not been included it was excluded and that's something that has caused a lot of concern 
uh, particularly this is the, the body that's supposed to be spearheading uh, um, the implementation of this strategy and other matters related to border management. Um, then um, in terms of, uh, of ECOWAS, um, a couple of years ago, I, I was um, involved in uh, helping ECOWAS to, um, to develop its original uh, um, border management strategy. Uh, and and um, that in, the, in that border region, uh, that border management strategy, uh, one of the key aspects related to how the crossing of uh, borders by women are handled, because as you know, in West Africa, uh, the border crossing is a, a there's a very high volume of border crossing by women uh, traders who uh, who use the, those points, and uh, in, in many times they, they are victimized by 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 people who uh, who manage those borders uh, uh, cr crossing posts. So in, in in some of the training that I've done uh, in in Cote d'Ivoire and Mauritania and uh, um, um, Burkina Faso and Niger, uh, what some of the sessions actually addressed on. Uh, our, uh, the sensitivity that led to um, handling people from different gender at, at the border. And uh, we, we, we had some pr practical cases where some of the participants actually showed how to do that uh, without infringing or being too intr intrusive uh, to the people who, who are being uh, screened. Uh, so they, they need to be more modules uh, for training, uh, particularly on how to handle um, People of different uh, gender at, at the border, and and uh, another problem that we, we we face is that when you go to most of those border crossing points, most of the people who, who are there are men, so we don't have uh, um, many women who are deployed there, and and the, the challenge is uh, the border border uh, uh, being deployed. The border is actually hardship. Most of them are hardship areas, and many of them the conditions are actually very harsh for for female to. Uh, but, uh, to be involved in the in in, uh, in the exercise of of, of of managing the borders, uh, then the uh, the other thing is that the African passport uh, that was supposed to be in place as part of the free movement of people, unfortunately, is not been a widespread uh, issued. It has only been issued to a um, few heads of state and. The, a few heads of state and a few officials of the African Union, it's yet, it's yet to become a reality. And uh, once that becomes a reality, uh, we hope that it will make it easier for Africans to not only to move uh, around the continent, but also to move their, their goods uh, across the continent. Great, thank is, you. Is there any question I missed? Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, sorry to interrupt. Is, is there any question I missed? Uh, no, I think that was good. There's one that came in I wanted to pose to you quickly. There's one that came in while you were speaking. Um, it's a regional question about DRC, uh, oh no, Republic of Congo and DRC and their borders with a border with Angola. Um, okay. Have you ever done any work in that area and do you have a sense of um, are there similar challenges to what we've heard about um, or is there anything particular about that case that that you can observe for us? No, no, no. I've been done anything on that board. Okay, I hope all right. Just checking. Yeah. Yeah. Just checking. Okay. But but, but 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 currently, I'm doing I'm I'm doing a work. I'm doing some work on the on the border between uh, Central Africa Republic and Chad, and um, also uh, Central Africa uh, Central Africa Republic and the uh, Sudan Darfur area. Mm -hmm. And what we are looking at, we're looking at the uh, local arrangements that exist on the border that could be beneficial to the, the national governments. In terms of uh, them uh, enhancing their capacity uh, to secure those borders. Hmm. So a study could come out about that that might be useful for our colleague from Angola who's posing this question. I would imagine there's similar challenges um, to some yeah, extent. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Uh, if I can get his uh, contacts, I'll be able to share with him uh, uh, the, the results of that study once it's completed. Okay. Great. Okay. So if. Um, the person um, who asked that question about the Angola DRC border wants to reach out um, to Africa Center, we'll, we'll put you in touch with Dr. Nkumu. Thank you. Great. Uh, mon colonel, colonel Diaye. Uh, si vous avez des colonel Jai, do you have any responses to those questions? Okay. With respect to the gender question, with respect as well to the general question. Uh, we've talked a lot about the issues related to 
how gender is treated. In Senegal, we don't have any particular issues with that. We have defined a strategy and we have a certain number of cells and their responsibility is to make sure that our gender strategy is fully enforced and properly enforced. In terms of development policies on a local level and participatory way between men and women, because in rural areas, women are essential economic actors. They benefit from the support of these measures. We have a certain number of structures in place whose function is to create employment opportunity. And that is why the decentralization law was created in order to strengthen competencies and capacities on a local level for development. So we have the the we have a fund that has doubled and it's practically tripled now. And this is a fund that is uh, distributed on a territorial level in order to guarantee sustainable development for women and for other actors. So we have a lot of structures at the state level which are working to support equality in terms of economic development. These structures are in place to support uh, projects. In terms of border security and how women are treated at borders, in the north, we have we have a number of objectives, uh, particularly um, pertaining to market farming, and we also have efforts to work with immigration with Mauritania and the local communities where people do market farming on either side of the border. So we have efforts to integrate women who are very important economic actors. So that's my answer with respect to the gender issue. But on the more general question, we were talking about how in the Sahel, we have, we have efforts in common with Mali, with Chad, with Niger, and these people have particular knowledge in how to fight cross-border organized crime. And they are trained to address the whole range of criminal threats. This is very interesting. I did not know this. There are Garcis in other Sahel states. Yes, there are in Mali and, and elsewhere. Another question, a, sh a short one that came up during your uh, speech. We have a Mauritanian colleague who also observed that there is a Mauritanian Senegalese mixed commission that does patrols uh, in other bordering countries. Could you confirm this or do you have a comment on that? Yeah, uh, I spoke about that quickly, I, just very, very quickly. When I was speaking of strengthening of trust between local populations and security forces and the state uh, to make sure that local populations needs are taken into account. So uh, this is part of decentralization that allows us to put in place development measures. So every year we have these planning meetings um, that involve Mauritania and Senegal in order to identify joint efforts uh, and joint needs on either side of the border. Uh, so these will involve security forces on the Mauritanian and Senegalese side. So we get together and we plan patrols together. 
and this this is part of our uh, shared security cooperation and it is about making sure that the presence of the state is felt in these areas and during these operations in a general manner it's what we call within the armed forces civilian military activities to give pharmaceutical uh, products, for example, to share pharmaceutical problems, products and medical assistance to local populations. And we had a colleague who asked about the presence of the government on the borders. First off, in terms of the uh, security and armed forces, in Senegal, we have a concept of security that we found was obsolete in the early around 2000. So now we have put in place a system of integrated governance of the territory. So today we have um, better ways to respond to threats. It's called the def uh, defense for the defense and security forces. But in many African countries, it's true that one of the fundamental problems is a lack of trust between the people and the uh, security forces. And I'm not going to go into details. There was a locality called Chima Jahan. When we realized it was a Guinean territory and the problem was therefore a Guinean problem, but there was a village that was that was quite modern. The environment, the other uh, villages around were quite jealous because this one little village had been really uh, well developed. And so that led to the creation of Prima, a program where every year we created what we called um, military action endeavor strategy and it is to really um, bring uh, implement um, implement improvements in neighboring areas as well and there was an act uh, in 1996 and act of number three that delegated various uh, competencies to the different areas, the different localities, which allowed them to self-govern to a degree and to respond to issues themselves. Yes, thank you for responding to the question that was raised by our colleague from Togo in terms of the areas where there is a lack of uh, state presence um, to really protect the people. So let me thank, we're over time. Um, so let me thank profusely both of our panelists, Dr. Okumu, Colonel Retired Jai. Thank you so much for a really rich conversation um, that traveled from different parts of the continent um, and that uh, provided a lot of detail um, about some of the successes that we've had um, in border protection and border management over the last decade or, or so, um, but also about um, the challenges that remain. Um, there's been a change, a shift in thinking um, and in paradigm in terms of how community members in border areas are being thought of. Um, I think that's a, as, as our panelists have conveyed, a really good thing for innovative solutions to border governance and border security challenges. There are also quite a few um, legal policy um, and resource-based challenges that remain to really leverage all of the rich sources of resilience that communities may help to provide and that um, state actors and international actors and those who are um, in different parts of the security sector could further leverage 
We have some inspiration from the Senegalese case, um, from what we learned about the trainings that Dr. Okumu has done with um, people who are officials in the IGAD or ECOWAS regions. We heard about the Garci um, in the armies uh, in some of the Sahelian states. That's another approach to dealing with this. And um, a lot of joint patrols and cross-border um, you know, uh, coordination that follow sometimes uh, cultural, linguistic, and community lines that really transcend the politically defined borders that were inherited from colonization, as some of our um, participants today have pointed out. So I think it's appropriate, um, as our panelists point out on Africa Day, to be having hopefully a conversation about um, creative solutions and ways to move forward with the really um, rich sources of resilience that communities that cross these borders, um, you know, uh, political as they be, may be, um, how that resilience can be captured. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today on Africa Day, uh, celebration of Africa's unity, commitment to peace, democracy, development. And thank you to Dr. Okumu and Colonel Jai for um, helping us celebrate that day through this webinar. Thank you everyone who's been part of the webinar series over the last two years. We've been doing this quarterly. This doesn't mean it's the end of discussions about border security, border governance, or organized crime. Uh, feel free to reach out um, in terms of um, keeping us updated on what you're doing in these areas um, or anything else we can do to help catalyze or amplify the work that we know um, those in the alumni community are constantly doing on these issues. We look forward to hearing from you. Um, my mailbox is open. You can reach me through the Africa Center website. Um, you know our community affairs team. And we're happy to connect you in ways that would be helpful for your work. Thank you again, everyone. And we'll see you next time there's a webinar.